Welcome to the September edition of the Tacoma Coffee House, where in the next hour, we'll consider the president's call for national education standards, find out what's in store for the old Blair High School, and hear how you can plug into your child's schooling. On In Sickness and In Health, the pros and cons of medical marijuana. We've got performance poetry by Alona Popper, followed by the Cajun sounds of Karen Collins and Ann Porcella on musical traditions. Then we'll survey what's hot in video rentals and book sales, and acclaimed author Maxine Clare joins us on Writer's Block to discuss her novel, Rattlebone. Hi, and welcome to Coffee House Forum. It's school time again, and that means it's time for a good measure of anxiety about how our kids are performing in the classroom. Many say the education system, even one as touted as Montgomery County's, is failing America by not preparing young people for an ever more competitive global economy. President Clinton proposes that states agree to give students uniform national tests to monitor achievement. And that's been quite controversial, as we'll hear in a few minutes from two distinguished leaders in the field of education. But first, the middle school muddle. Tacoma students are currently being bused to, to Rockville, while their middle school on Piney Branch Road is being rebuilt. Then there's the matter of Blair High School on Wayne Avenue. What will be with that creaky facility once the new Blair High opens next year at the intersection of University and Colesville Road? For that report, here's Gina Jordan. The Tacoma Park unification will create a new beginning for an old school. Soon the halls of Blair High will be filled with new faces as it might become the first combination elementary middle school in the county. Parents and county officials are hoping this will be the answer to the recent boom in enrollment. The use of the Blair facility for an instructional program for both elementary and or middle school uh, is designed primarily to relieve overcrowding in that community. Increased enrollment has classrooms bursting at the seams at the elementary and middle school levels. That problem will be addressed by building new, larger schools set to open next year. Now that Montgomery Blair High School will be moving up to the Four Corners area and opening up into that new school in September of 1998, it'll leave the current site available for both an elementary school and a middle school. Marilyn Schoenfeld says her son will have to be bused 45 minutes away. This is a result of overcrowding of schools in the Blair Cluster. Schoenfeld welcomes the idea of the combination format and foresees a setting fitting for both age groups. The design that we're talking about would keep the children separate most of the time. There'd be two entrances, one for the elementary. There'd be two separate bus loops, one for the elementary, one for the middle. There would be one kitchen and either one or two uh, cafeteria spaces, but they would not be mixed together. The cost of transforming the current site of Blair High into an elementary middle school is estimated at more than $13 million. New teachers will be hired for the additional 400 students joining the county. As the doors are opening at the new Blair High School, new students can start with a clean slate here at the old. Reporting for Tacoma Coffee House, I'm Gina Jordan. Gina reports that the boundaries for the new K-8 school are yet to be set. In his State of the Union address in February, President Clinton challenged the 50 states to administer two voluntary national education tests, in English and in math. This may seem like a commonsensical approach to gauging how well our schools and kids are performing, but thus far only six states have signed on to the President's call, and there's considerable opposition from Rep Republican advocates of localism in education from people fearing that teachers will focus too much on prepping students for the tests, and from some who fear that uniform standards will test, will stigmatize poor communities that lack for educational resources. With me to discuss national education standards are Sharon Robinson, former assistant U.S. Secretary of Education under the Clinton administration, and now a vice president with the Educational Testing Service. They're the ones who bring us the SATs. Also with me is Robert McClure, a senior policy associate with the National Asso Education Association Center for Innovation. Welcome to Tacoma Coffee House. Thank you. Uh, Sharon Robinson, uh, there is concern that the president's initiative will usurp the, historically, uh, the historical province of local districts in controlling education. Uh, how do you respond to that concern? 
Well, I think that's, um, that's really not a concern, should not be a concern. The national tests would be embedded in tests that local uh, school authorities would select. Uh, tests that would be selected to measure their locally selected curriculum. But the items from the national test would be able to inform local citizens as to how well students are performing on a national, uh, in a national sample. So the national test, if you will, would not even be visible to students at the local level because items would be embedded in the test that they would normally take. And those tests would be selected by the local authority. So it's really kind of a mix and match for local communities to decide what's in the exam? It would be an opportunity for the local community to decide how to uh, include a measure that would allow them to uh, really make comparable assessments. You can see how well the students are doing based on locally selected curriculum and assessments, but you could also see how well students are doing based on a national measure, if that is of interest. If that is not of interest, then local communities would not opt to include those items in their assessment. Uh, I'm a little confused. How is it that you could include local um, items and have a national measure? Robert McClure. That's a question that Sharon's more uh, likely to answer than I am. B before you get to that, I'd, I'd like to deal with another issue that's slightly above that, if I may. Um, uh, the, the issue of what our schools should look like in terms of stu what students do in them and what they learn is, to me, in large measure, a local issue and a local matter. Uh, the people of Montgomery County know very well what it is that their youngsters ought to be able to do and know in order to, because of going to school. But I like to take a step beyond that and to suggest that what youngsters in this school district and in all of the other school districts in the United States learn about is, is indeed a national issue. And, uh, and to that extent, I think President Clinton and other national leaders in both parties are, are absolutely right to suggest that there are, there are, there is content that youngsters ought to know about and be skillful and have depth in, in order to compete in a world in which it is going to be terribly important that youngsters be literate about language, about technology, about science, and about the other great public policy issues. With that as a context, it seems to me that the whole issue of testing then becomes um, embedded, if you will, in that context. And how does testing, whether it's embedded in a local test or whether it turns out someday to be a national test, which it, I don't think it ever would be here, how does that, how does that move that goal forward, that we have a national citizenry that is competent because they went to our schools, be they Montgomery or wherever, because they went to these schools in order to perform well in that society. So I think there are a couple of issues related to that. One of them is, do test as we now understand them and know about them help us to achieve that goal? And, and if they do, then what kind of support, as you suggested earlier, you know, are teachers going to be teaching to these tasks? Well, let's, th let me ask yeah. you about that question. Uh, I think a lot of people would be concerned if that were true. Uh, some people say, well, that's good. Uh, other people say, well, if you teach to the test, you're not really focused on the essence of learning and the process of learning. You're trying to fill kids up with facts. It's like cramming for a final exam uh, so that they <laughs> score high enough to pass the test. It makes the school and the school district look good, uh, gets the kid on uh, and isn't stigmatized, but is that really what learning is about? You teach to the test if it's a good test. Mm. And if it's not a good test, I don't want anybody teaching to it. So if it's worth learning, it's worth testing. And if it's worth being taught, it ought to be taught everyone so that they could perform well on the test. So we've got, we've got some confusing issues here. Those who say it's not appropriate to teach to the test, I think see testing as a competitive process and rather than a process of documenting learning. Those who feel that uh, it's horrific to teach to the test also often feel that um, you have to use the test as some kind of guessing game to sort out students. Well, that's what kind of test we are we talking about? Is it a test that's going to assess whether students have accumulated a certain body of facts 
or is it a test that's going to attempt to appraise whether students have developed a certain critical faculty so that they can learn about subject matter for themselves? Both and. Both and. And, yes. The uh, assessment that, is, that has been proposed by the administration would include uh, items that would test facts. You have to have content. Give me an example also, of a fact you need to know. Well, you need to know the capital of the 50 states, or you need to know how to, you need Ooh, to know the I'm parts. I'm in trouble. <laughs> well, the parts of a sentence, or you need to know uh, arithmetic facts. You need to know how to compute. But more than knowing how to compute, you also need to know what the computation means. Do you understand that multiplication is another way to add? or that division is a way of taking away or subtracting. Students have, have to understand the concepts of what they're doing and not just the operations. I think once so, they start getting paychecks, they'll understand that division is a process that, of taking away. At that point, it does become quite clear. Let me ask you a question. Some people are very concerned that these tests, uh, as we saw in one of the quotes at the beginning of this segment, are going to be used to stigmatize poor communities, that we already know what the results are going to be, that kids from resource-rich communities are going to pass this test, the school districts are going to look good, and kids from poor districts are going to do poorly, and it's going to make the school districts look bad and stigmatize those kids. Uh, is that what the purpose, uh, it can't be the purpose of this exam, but isn't that going to be the effect? Well, if we don't change the way we do business in American schools, that will indeed be the effect. No matter how clever we are at, at preparing these tests, that's indeed going to be the fact. The fact of the matter is, though, that, uh, that I think that we're getting a lot smarter about the whole issue about how kids learn and how we can teach them and provide the resources to do it. For example, there are hundreds of projects in urban cities now across the United States in which youngsters who are poor, who are often minority, who are living in the worst parts of the cities in terms of the economics and job situation and health and the like, who are outperforming youngsters in the suburbs. We have, in, there is not a city in the United States in which that kind of school does not exist. We know more now than we have ever known uh, about how to achieve this goal of everybody can learn at very high standards at, in very important ways. We got to figure out how to make that scale up so well, wouldn't we can make it, make it happen more everywhere. sense, perhaps, to take the money that the $32 million in the first two years of President Clinton's proposed program and focus those resources on replicating those programs that do work? I think the administration is trying to do both strategies, as a matter of fact. Um, a lot more money is going into Title I schools to implement strategies that bring in the kind of teaching processes and, and materials that really enrich the curriculum and, and, and enrich instruction. Uh, the, the administration has proposed strategies on both sides of the equation. So I believe that we are really trying to cover the waterfront um, in that way. What is missing, however, is some comparable measure that will let each community know and let the country know where we're not living up to our potential and meeting our responsibility because we will have a, a, an achievement standard, an achievement measure that will let us know that. Yeah, but Sharon's absolutely right. You've got to keep the pressure on on both sides of that because we can test until the cows come home. We've got to have the resources to make it happen. Afraid the bell's ringing on this class. Thanks to Sharon Robinson and Robert McClure for joining us in the coffee house. Till next time, and even thereafter, I'm Mark Cohen for Coffee House Forum. Coming up, medical marijuana on In Sickness and in Health, then poetry by Alona Popper, the Cajun tunes of Karen Collins and Ann Porcella, what Tacoma is reading and watching, and author Maxine Clear. But first, Cindy Allen wants a word with you. This year, the National PTA published a new set of standards for parent-family involvement in their children's education. In the foreword to those standards, the National PTA president wrote, quote, over 30 years research has proven beyond dispute the positive connection between parent involvement and student success. Effectively engaging parents and families in the education of their children has the potential to be far more transformational than any other type of education reform, unquote. Did you know that the best predictor of a student's achievement in school is not income or social status? It's the extent to which that student's family is involved in their education. 
by creating a home environment that encourages learning, by communicating high but reasonable expectations for their children, and by becoming involved in their children's education at school and in the community. If you want to get involved, there are many times and places for you to do that. At school, at home, even in the workplace, during the school day, in evenings, on weekends. The important thing is to be an active partner in your child's education. One good place to start is back to school night. If you can make time for just one thing at your child's school this year, please make that be it. If you don't know when it is, call the school to find out. In Montgomery County, it's usually in September. You'll have a chance to meet your child's teachers and principal, get an idea about what they'll be teaching this year, and get a feeling for the school. From then on, all year that feeling and familiarity will help when you talk with your child about school because you'll already have made some sort of connection of your own with the school and your child's place in it. If you've missed back to school night, then go to your school's next PTA meeting. Find out what happened at back to school night there and get to know what programs and problems are being worked on at your school. If you're still not sure what you can do, ask your child's teacher, the principal, or other parents. The important thing is to jump in. Your participation will definitely make a big difference to your child and the school. And remember, if you can, please go to back to school night. Hi, and welcome to In Sickness and in Health. Although voters in Arizona and California last year passed referenda that allow some narrow legal uses of marijuana for very ill patients, the Clinton administration says it will still enforce federal laws to prosecute people in those states who use pot even under a doctor's direction. Advocates of medical marijuana argue grass is effective in combating pain and nausea. It's cheap and it has no negative long-lasting effects. Opponents contend that legally available pharmaceuticals can do as well for the suffering patients. And they say allowing use of any banned drug is a crack in the door, sorry, to widespread use of pot and other illegal drugs. Here with us to make the case for marijuana as medicine is Tacoma Park resident Chuck Thomas, Director of Communications for the Marijuana Policy Project. We invited the drug czar Barry McCaffrey's office to join us and explain the Clinton administration's position to medical mar marijuana, but they failed to send a representative. So it's you and me, Chuck. Welcome to Tacoma Coffee House. Thank you. I wonder straight out if you'd explain the Marijuana Policy Project and the reasons mm -hmm. that you think marijuana should be used medically for in an illegal setting. Sure. Well, the Marijuana Policy Project is a lobbying organization in Washington, D.C., and we advocate changing the marijuana laws on the federal and state level. The reason that we're involved in the medicinal marijuana issue is because marijuana works for many patients with many conditions. Now that's just not advocates that say that. In February, the National Institutes of Health um, put together a panel to examine the issue and they concluded that for some people it does make a difference. Now our question is, what should happen to those people? All you have to do is ask around the neighborhood and everyone will know someone, an aunt, a grandmother perhaps, uh, who has used marijuana for medicine at one time. There are thousands of patients nationwide who are already using it. The big problem is this. Presently, this is the government's health care plan for these patients. Federal law, as well as the laws in Maryland, the District of Columbia, and every state in the nation, treat medicinal marijuana no differently than the recreational use of marijuana. If you're using marijuana for medicine, the government doesn't care. They'll treat you like a common crook. Pardon me, a common criminal, you can be arrested and sent to prison. But you say it works for some <coughs> patients under some circumstances. Yes. Is that enough to actually go ahead and approve it for use um, across the country for everyone? Well, what the California law, the new California law does, and what we're hoping to um, enact laws similarly in other states, the law says that if you're a patient, and the police show up at your door and you have a doctor's note saying that the doctor believes that marijuana is the best treatment for you, the individual patient, that you cannot be arrested, prosecuted, and sent to prison. 
We think that sounds very reasonable. There's no need to prosecute patients for using their medicine. The South office, though, would argue that there are pharmaceuticals available which are legal, which do just the same job. So why resort to something that is actually banned in this country so far? Well, luckily, for many patients, there are legal alternatives. So lots of people who have cancer, AIDS, glaucoma, don't need to use marijuana. And that's great. No one's going to put a gun to their heads and force them to use it. But what about those patients who've tried everything and nothing else seems to work? What about those patients who go to their doctors and the doctors say, you know, we've tried everything. I believe that you need to use some marijuana. The research backs it up. Uh, the NIH panel says that it works for some people. You might be one of those people. I think you should try it. What should happen to that patient and what should happen to that doctor? We believe that the federal government has no business butting its nose into the doctor-patient relationship, and certainly it does not help anyone in society to arrest the patient and put the patient in prison. Butting its nose, um, if we let doctors get away with prescribing whatever they like, that, that is some restriction that is actually needed to prevent any, any kind of uh, drugs being prescribed by doctors, so you have to have laws against that. Um, the NIH, NIH study you referred to um, actually said there was no proof that marijuana does better than the available pharmaceutical drugs that you can get. Well, they said that for some people it does. And uh, certainly the FDA would like to have another couple of studies done so that they can decide exactly how it should be marketed, labeled, and sold in pharmacies. And we've been trying to get that research underway now for about three years. Unfortunately, the federal government will not provide the marijuana necessary for those studies. But that's only one question, th that question of how should it be marketed, labeled, and sold in pharmacies. The other question is, what about patients who right now are already growing and using their own marijuana at home to treat serious illnesses? What should happen to them? And again, as I said, there's, there's a tremendous amount of research already out there. These uh, right here are 70 different studies, which at one time or another have, uh, have been conducted over the past 20 years, published in peer review journals, that show that it does work for some people. So again, what should happen to those people? We'd like to change the laws to simply say that if you're a patient and your doctor believes that you need to use it, that you shouldn't be arrested for it. I think everyone right. will agree with that. The NIH said that more research needs to be done. So although there's obviously a lot already been done, perhaps it's not under the strict conditions that the uh, FDA would require. Uh, what are the steps being taken in this way right now to get more studies to prove, if you like, that it has some better effects than the pharmaceutical drugs available? Well, again, what we need to do is to get access to the federal government's marijuana. Ideally, the federal government would change its law so that it no longer has a monopoly on the supply of marijuana for research. But again, that's only to determine exactly what the package should look like, what the, exactly what the, warning should label, what the warning label should say when it's sold in a pharmacy. What we're dealing with now is an emergency situation where thousands of patients are already using something and they can be arrested at any given moment. Every time they hear a bump in the night, they have to worry, is this the government finally coming in to tear my mm -hmm. house apart, handcuff me, put me in prison, seize my property, take my children away from me? They have to worry about that every single day. And that kind of stress is terrible for patients, especially patients uh, with AIDS and, and other ailments that affect their immune systems, to have to live under that kind of that kind of stress. But are, is that actually happening? Are they having their doors knock, uh, knocked on in the middle of the night? And oh, absolutely. Taken off? So it is a very real fear. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are, there are dozens of patients that we know of who've been arrested even in the past couple of years. I mean, mm -hmm. most patients who are arrested we'll never hear about mm -hmm. because they're you know, arrested, they, they have their trials, they're taken off, they don't know how to get in touch with us. When do you think it's possible we could have legalization for medical use, or do you think that's way down the road? Well, what we really need to do right now is to get bills introduced in state legislatures and get state legislatures to simply uh, remove criminal penalties for patients who use marijuana with their doctor's approval. That would be glaucoma patients? Cancer, cancer AIDS, patients. multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. Then what needs to happen uh, in other states that don't pass those bills uh, are more ballot initiatives in November of 1998. 
And then after that, hopefully the federal government will get the message. In fact, Barney Frank has a bill pending in Congress right now, H.R. 1782. Mm -hmm. And uh, we suggest that everyone write to your local representative, uh, Representative Wynn, I believe, for uh, Montgomery County, and uh, ask him to co-sponsor H.R. 1782 and also to contact the Marijuana Policy Project. We're in Washington, D.C. We need volunteers. Uh, we need members. Uh, we'll, we'll take any kind of help that we can get to help pressure the federal and state governments to simply change the laws so that patients can no longer be considered criminals for right. using their medicine. So in the meantime, you say to patients who are already using this too, just uh, go ahead, uh, but make sure they don't get caught at it. They're going to have to be very careful, yes. Right. How did you get into this um, marijuana policy project? Have your background? Well, I studied uh, criminology in college and uh, learned that most of the reasons that the, uh, the government gives for having marijuana prohibition um, actually are being hurt by the policies themselves. In other words, um, because of prohibition, um, marijuana is easier for children to get. Uh, effective education has been thwarted. And of course, the most serious issue of all is that patients can't get it for medicine. When you look at the amounts of money that are being spent putting people in prison, not just medical users, but anyone, when you look at the police resources that are being devoted towards arresting marijuana users, rather than going after the serious criminals that, that threaten us every day, mm -hmm. um, you know, there are so many problems that need to be dealt with with very rational, reasonable policies that look at the pros and cons of all options and decide each issue on its own merits what can we do to minimize the harm associated with marijuana? Someone needs to be lobbying to change those laws, and um, my colleagues and I decided that it should be us. Well, you certainly got your work cut out for you. Um, we do. We're unfortunately out of time here. Okay. So a big thank you to Chuck Thomas of the Marijuana Policy Project for sharing a leaf from his book, so to speak, on this very controversial subject. Until next time, in sickness and in health, I'm Kathy Christensen. Still to come, author Maxine Clare, the Cajun sounds of Karen Collins and Ann Porcella, but first, poetry by Alona Popper. I never saw the place where the wound was when your father shot himself. It must be buried lost in some drawer and fading, like the print he sent to make you laugh because he'd grown a beard at sea. When you were young, he was gone long times. You told me late, after childhood, where we had all known him the hero of your stories. I tried to see him, exploding, his mind spattered on the side of your house. It was your soft face instead. Your eyes fixed on the road ahead of us. Your voice moving against your closing throat. He always came home. Just when it had become too much. And you'd left your mother one more last time. Voice carried high from the room where she was. She never showed you where the gap sits, hidden, tucked into blood-hooded folds between your thighs. Didn't even sit like you did, telling that the boy who said fuck meant men and women loving each other. Telling how. I could not imagine a place for that in you in me, no place for a hole in grandfather's face. Maybe she would have kept from you how it had looked, but you saw his wound, like the hole between her legs if she had spread them apart, the way I wanted you to when you told me about men and women loving each other.
inte nära plut, hon är inte nära plut Så jag ser på hon är rädd Fade en asse barn, det är 20 karabän Men som en som hon går gå, du fade dem alla då Hon är inte nära plut, hon är inte nära plut Hon är inte nära plut, så jag ser på hon är rädd Welcome everybody, I'm David Eisner and this is the musical traditions portion of the show. A special welcome to Karen Collins and Anne Porcelli. <laughs> How'd I do on the name? Well, yeah, that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> Was that the... The Porcella family in the United States says Porcella. Okay, so. but they're not in like the mafia, I mean, I don't no, have to No, worry. no, no, no. Okay, and that no. was the Cajun pronunciation. Right. <laughs> okay. So what do we have here? We have Cajun music. That's right. Tell me about it. Tell me, tell me a brief 30 second history of Cajun music. Well, it comes uh, from southwestern Louisiana. The, it's uh, French-speaking people down there. And it's, it's dance music. It's real lively, usually dances. And it's often played with, they typically have an accordion, a fiddle, a guitar, and usually there's a bass and drums in the band. This being a low-budget show, we just brought guitar and fiddle. That's right. Okay. <laughs> How does it differ from um, another form of Louisiana music called Zydeco? Zydeco music is typically more from the black tradition and Cajun's more from the white. The, in the Zydeco music you have more um, electric instruments and the, there's more rhythm and blues influence. Um, Zydeco doesn't usually have a, a fiddle, they often have a rub board though. Mm -hmm. A fratois? We rehearsed that. That's, that's right, <laughs> a fratois. Okay. Cajun might have a triangle or a tifair. But the, the what Zydeco was the name of the tune that you just played? That was called uh, Steppin' Fast or Tanayita Nada Plu. That's easy for you to say. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, well, I'll tell you what, before we do more questions, how about, let's see, that was a two step you played? Yep. Okay. And now you'll go into a well, what? A waltz. You're going to play the other fiddle. Um, yeah, Cajun music is a lot about, about playing for the dancers. It's become that. Um, and that's how I came to it through dancing. Okay. And the first, the first tune, um, you do a, a, a two-step, kind of like the way you do to country music, and, and this is a waltz, and often at Cajun dances, which, you know, anybody can find out about and go to, the, the musicians will switch back and forth, do a two-step, then do then a waltz. Do a waltz. Well, I'll, two -step. I'll waltz off stage while you play. What's the name of the waltz? This one's called La Malides. And that uh, translates? Oh, unhappy one. Oh, unhappy one. Well, I'll be the happy one, and I'll <laughs> leave it to you guys.
べる前ノートたきて See me uh, waltzing around the studio while you were playing there. Sure. Um, what's the Cajun scene like in the Washington D.C. area? There is a big Cajun zydeco dance scene in this area. There's uh, a lot of Cajun dances, a lot of mainly zydeco bands that come up from Louisiana. There's a, so there's a real big dance crowd. Can we, can we drop names of a good place to go Cajun dancing? Sure. There's. Um, Glen Echo Park, there's Cherry Hill Park. Um, Twist and Shout. Twist and Shout has a lot of bands that come through. Mark Gretchel's done an amazing job with Twist and Shout, and that he's he's really kept he that really scene has. going. He really has. He's he's done a lot for that. Speaking of name dropping, uh -huh. um, do either of you play in a Cajun band by any <laughs> chance? I just happened to play in a Cajun oh. band, David. It's called uh, Squeeze By You. Right, and the first tune that you played is that? Oh, that's right. The first tune we played is called Step and Fast, which is also the name of our CD. Aha. Uh -huh. And that's available in the Washington area. That's right. If I it, wanted to buy one of those, how would I do that? Well, you could buy one at uh, House of Musical Traditions at Tacoma Park. Uh -huh. Shameless. We're just <laughs> shameless. Or at any one of those dances. That's right. right. We sell them ourselves at the dances. Right. Um, you brought two fiddles. What was? Give us the quick fiddle tunings. There's obviously a reason you bring right, two this fiddles. Right, tune, this fiddle's tuned down a whole step. Um, and that's what's typically done there to play with a C accordion, to play in the keys of C ah, and G. Okay. And the other one's just in standard tuning. E, A, D, G. No. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, how about one last tune to take us out of here? Sure. This, is a, this will be another two step. This one's called Oh Madeline. Which translates? into O Madlin. Oh, of course. Mad <laughs> <laughs> okay, take it away and you'll hear me banging around out there.
Next up, Writer's Block with host Lisa Page. Welcome to Writer's Block. Novelist Jessica Hagedorn called the fictional small town of Rattlebone a haunting world peopled with vivid and surprising characters and a language full of dark music. The creator of this amazing community and author of the collection of short stories, Rattlebone, is Maxine Clare. Maxine Clare was born in Kansas City, Kansas. Before becoming a writer, she worked as chief medical technologist at Children's Hospital in Washington, D.C. Rattlebone won the prestigious Chicago Tribune Heartland Prize in 1994. Miss Clare also received a Guggenheim Fellowship in 1996. Her other book is a volume of poetry entitled Coping with Gravity. She is now Associate Professor of English at George Washington University. Thanks for joining us at the Coffee House. My pleasure, Lisa. Would you talk about how this book came to be? What was the genesis of putting together Rattlebone? Um, you know, Lisa, I think that this book probably started for me um, maybe five or six years before I knew I was going to even write stories about this place called Rattlebone. Um, I had a conversation, had several conversations with some African American women who had been school teachers in Kansas City in the 1930s and 1940s. And that happened, I don't know, maybe in 1989 or 1990. Mm -hmm. And um, they were women who I remembered, not all of them were my teachers, but they were sure. women who I remembered being very, very de dedicated to us and mm -hmm. um, who lived lives of focus around their careers, who were not married, who sacrificed pretty, pretty much everything for mm -hmm. their students. And I was so taken by their stories. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I thought I would write their story or their stories. I just wanted the world to know about these women. And out of that, I did write a, I did begin a story about a woman whose fictional name was October Brown. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was going to be writing the story of one of these women, but as it turned out, uh, this young girl who was narrating the story took the story over, mm -hmm. and so that was uh, that was a story, and I and that was as it was. And as time went on, more stories came in this narrative voice, and and I ended up just following it and hoping to get back to these women, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I never mm -hmm. got back to. I ended up uh, just listening to our, the woman, the character who is now Irene. Irene, Irene. and. Uh, the book is uh, autobiographical in the sense that it's set in a place and a time when I grew up in Kansas City, Kansas, mm -hmm. and Rattlebone is very much like the community where I grew up. And how did you, the Rattlebone, does it have a particular? Well, um, it's, a, it's a, an interesting thing. I, when I was out there that, that year, one of the teachers said to me that she, uh, she was actually uh, talking about a part of her own life, and she mentioned a place that was known as Rattlebone Hollow. Mm -hmm. And I had never heard of it in my childhood. I lived out there mm -hmm. all my young life. And I asked her about it, and she said, oh, yeah, out in the north end, it used to be called Rattlebone Hollow. And she said that she thought the Native Americans had named it wow. Rattlebone Hollow. And I knew that Native Americans had maybe li lived out in that area sometime before. And other people confirmed that, that it used to be called Rattlebone Hollow. I couldn't find anything about it at the library or in historical mm -hmm. um, documentation or anything. I never found anything about it. Mm -hmm. uh, just a few weeks ago, I got a letter in the mail from a woman in Florida who had done some doctorate work uh, in Kansas City, Kansas in the 70s. Oh, wow. Who had researched that name. Oh, my. And who had found that there was a place called Rattlebone Hollow. Oh, wow. And there were several stories about how it got its name. But mm -hmm. I wanted it to live, so I sure. just named my, my, oh. my community Rattlebone. Oh, no, it's, it's lovely. Yeah. And the, this first story, uh, the October mm -hmm. Brown story, told by Irene. Yes is so riveting because could you say what happens i mean what she's what she finds well, out irene about? discovers that she that <coughs> her teacher october brown is having uh an affair with her father yeah. and she discovers it in the way that children discover where she's never doesn't have direct evidence mm -hmm. but she can tell by the way her mother behaves and by the way her father behaves mm -hmm. and by the way the teacher behaves to her and other things that she sees and she doesn't fully understand the knowledge that she has mm -hmm. but she knows it mm -hmm. at cell level she knows something is wrong and that this is, this is probably it and as the story goes on 
we find that Irene gets her revenge she on October certainly Brown. Does. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's, it's and there's so many um, situations like that too for this young girl, mm -hmm. Irene, and mm -hmm. that she also finds her mother. She witnesses her mother yes. um, involved with yes. someone else. Yes. And, uh, these are, I, I call it a coming of age story for mm -hmm. Irene because the stories are all interconnected. And, and I think coming of age is about uh, the, the illusions falling away. Mm -hmm. But it's also about developing our own moral codes mm -hmm. and having our own experiences and, and moving past um, the sort of exterior influences of how we come to be and moving more toward the interior of mm -hmm. who we are. And I think this is what Irene was attempting to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and so the stories are told by different points of view. Yes. Um, I mean, it's first person and third person, but it's also all these different characters of Rattlebone. Yes. And yes. I was amazed by one, you, I, I, the chapter escapes me right now, mm -hmm. but the story, but it's a woman who's the landlady, Lydia who's married Pemberton, Pemberton, yes. and how you know she's just like he just did that yes. on purpose just yes. to make me, and it's completely different from yes. Irene's voice or uh, no that uh, it's, it's interesting you know mm -hmm. as a writer that these voices just come and you you take them when they come along mm -hmm. but um, I wanted to tell Lydia's story in an in an omniscient narrative voice mm -hmm. I didn't want. Lydia's voice there, right? Because she, because that's the only place that she appears in the book, and I wanted more continuity. So I, I really wasn't so interested in having her voice, mm -hmm. and as I heard her voice, I was translating to another narrator, and it just didn't work. Oh wow! And finally, I just let her have just her voice. <coughs> well, would you give us an example of um, one of the voices? Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm just going to read a paragraph. This is uh, from the story called. Um, the Great War, and this is about Irene's mother, Perline. It is, it is dusk. You could say that every time Perline has come out to sit on her front porch, every time she has sat in the flamingo pink glider that with every rocking glide squawks from its warp of metal on metal, every time she has brought her comb and brush and sat in the glider combing her just washed hair every evening, that she's painted her toenails pink on the porch while she watched the children play hopscotch every single evening after ironing tablecloths and pinafores all day, after laying white shirts out on the table to sprinkle and roll like white jelly rolls to be ironed and on hangers, all turned the same way by six o'clock when cars drive up to collect the blouses and skirts, the white shirts with not too much starch and Lord no, no bluing, no bleach. All those evenings, after all those days, you could say, that she has been waiting. Oh, it's so lovely. And that story, the title, The Great War, I thought, oh, this is going to be about World, World War, War II. II right? And you have another story, uh, A Secret Love, yes. where I thought it was going to be a secret love Romance, affair. Yeah. And it's really this sister's love, yes. this deep For love she, she has. Yes. Um, and it, the surprises you've mm -hmm. got all the way through the book, mm -hmm. they're just, you're set up for one thing and then, mm -hmm. you know, there's a... There's a I would really like to take um, full credit for that. <laughs> I'd like to take, and I tell my students too. You know, when somebody says you did something well, I say, "Oh yes, of course I did." Yeah. But um, but it's it's some of the gift that, that that happens when you're writing. You don't know that it's not such a conscious and logical and rational process. Mm -hmm. You're there and you're doing it, and suddenly this thing pops up and you take advantage of it, and and of course you claim it as your very own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, but those are the moments that writers live for. Oh, when yeah. something comes together for you in a book, oh, it's, it's wonderful. And it's throughout. And you have such a vivid portrayal of childhood mm -hmm. in, in the sense of, of, of and adolescence. Mm -hmm. um, and we see these characters mm -hmm. grow and change, and, mm -hmm. and some, in some cases, die. Yes. And uh, it was, and the one child loses an eye. Yes. And, you yes. know, it's, it's. Uh, but that's really what life is. And that's really. It is, and um, I also think that that all of our experiences, our emotional experiences after childhood, we, we make those reference points in childhood mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. always go back to those well, times. Absolutely. We always go back to the, the first time I felt this way, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. if we don't do it consciously. And uh, those early experiences are the ones that set, our, set up our lives. Mm -hmm. And in some ways I wanted to dramatize those moments mm -hmm. that everybody experiences. Mm -hmm. Everybody has, mm -hmm. has this, t this first loss. Right. Or this first um, 
moment of truth mm -hmm. or this first lie or this first kiss the first I mean kiss, you know yes. it's it, and this is the other thing is it's such a sensual mm. piece of work mm. in the way that you carry um, details mm. um, the smell of the earth or the the sound mm. of the uh, you know background noise mm -hmm. or um, and the intimacy of these characters mm. is really uh, I think um, we were talking earlier about detail and I think when you live with a character and really, really get into that character's skin, then you begin to experience the world the way the character would. Mm -hmm. And so in any given moment, all of our senses are there, mm -hmm. available, yes. to take in whatever is there. And, yeah. and if, if we're lucky, yeah. you know, we get to get a smell or a sound or, or whatever right. it is in the environment. Right. Yeah. And it's there. Yeah. We are just about out of time, uh, but I just, um, would also like to say that it's it, your next work. Are you willing to say will it include? Well, yes. Was, yeah. I did tell that secret. <laughs> My next, uh, I'm working on a novel, and October Brown is in the novel. Oh, That's I'm all so I'm glad. going to say. No, because I, I didn't. I've been dying to know yes. what happened to her. <laughs> right. So, so that's okay. very good. Okay. And um, and some of the other characters, maybe we can hope for down the road too. To maybe learn, maybe learn we'll something. see. Yes, we'll see. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and thanks so much, Maxine. Oh, it's for, my pleasure. For uh, coming on. It's Glad been to be great. here. Once again, the name of the novel is Rattlebone. It's available at Chuck and Dave's bookstore in Tacoma Park. Thanks to author Maxine Clare for joining us. I'm Lisa Page, and this has been Writer's Block. And that's it for the September edition. See you next month in the Tacoma Coffee House. Thank mm -hmm. you.